classes. We have a special class. If you're visiting with us today and you have children like to send them, we have a children's church over there, and they'll get a great uh, lesson on their level. <clears throat> All right. What a great-looking group. Is it a good thing or a bad thing when you dismiss the kids and have your crowd this day, man? First Timothy chapter 6. As we look at growth this year, uh, we will look at a variety of subjects and often uh, practical, some more theological in nature of the messages that we have, but uh, all of them, uh, if, if it's not able to be put into use, then it's not really worthy of preaching, in my opinion. I mean, again, I've, I've often said this, and I believe this with all of our heart, the purpose of our Bible study and preaching at Bible Baptist Church is not knowledge, but application. So we want to apply the Word of God to our life and to help it, to, or for it to help us grow. David Scudder writes a story about how Satan attacks a Christian. Uh, first, Satan uh, shoots, he writes, a poisonous dart at the, at the Christian's heel. But the Christian was unharmed because his feet were protected with the message of God's peace. Next, Satan shot an arrow at his waist. But the Christian repelled this easily because his waist was protected with the belt of truth. Third, the devil tried shooting him in the chest. But there was a, uh, there he wore the breastplate of righteousness. If, if you're wondering where these things come from, Ephesians chapter 6 talks about all this. So that deflected the arrow. The Christian also repelled other arrows with the shield of faith and with the helmet of salvation. But the devil was determined, and he is determined, to take the Christian down. So he slipped around the Christian and shot him in his pocketbook, and this brought him down. It's a fairy tale or, or an allegory, but I, I make it a point every so often to preach on materialism. And if we want to make growth a reality in our Christian life, we have to address this problem that every one of us deal with on some level. Years ago, D.L. Moody was asked to speak at a church, and the pastor was a little embarrassed because uh, he, he said, you know, to, he was, you know, D.L. Moody was very well known. He, he felt bad because his people had a habit of walking out halfway through the message. And, you know, you invite a visiting preacher and you don't want that to happen. It looks bad. And so uh, D.L. Moody said, you know, he doesn't, th he doesn't even think he'll have any problem keeping them. And so he got up to preach that morning. And Brother Moody said that uh, his message that morning, the first half is going to be for the wicked people, and the second half is going to be for the good one. And everybody stayed till the end. Uh, we like to see ourselves as good people, right? Well, I want today to tell you that all of this message is going to be directed towards rich people, but I don't want you to leave, okay? Stick around, and we'll talk about this from the Bible, because uh, we, uh, we think there's a message in here for all of us. I'm talking today about a problem that is so rampant in our society and in our church. Materialism is a preoccupation with possessions, believing that they bring happiness and success. When it comes to materialism, has any nation ever surpassed what we're seeing in America today? We're a materialistic society. When it comes to materialism, we define our lives by how much stuff we have. We define our social status by how much money we make and where we live. We define uh, even our dates on our calendar are rife with materialism. Think about the fact of the birthday parties that we throw for our children and shower them with gifts. The biggest holiday of all, Christmas, really is, uh, uh, has become much more about materialism than it has about the birth of Christ. And so materialism is all around us. We deify the wealthiest Americans in shows like the lifestyles of the rich and famous. We spend more in America annually on jewelry, shoes, and watches than we spend on education. Shopping malls are our churches. Celebrities are our God. Magazines like People and Vogue are our Bibles. President Jimmy, Jimmy Carter, I don't quote him often, but he said this, human identity is no longer defined by what one does, but by what one has. And very true. But no matter what we have, it never seems like enough. We always want more. In the book, The Overspent American, he writes that 27%, that's almost a third, of households that make over $100,000 a year say that they do not have enough to buy the things that they need. It's never enough. Now, why have we become so materialistic? Well, there's probably many reasons we could point to. I want to look at a couple today, though. Uh, there's a rampant unhappiness in our nation today. There's an old legend about three men crossing the desert on horseback in the middle of the night. They came to a dried-up pond bed, 
And they heard a voice commanding them to stop and dismount and to pick up some pebbles. They were told to put them in their pocket and not look at them until the light of day. The men were promised that if they obeyed, they would be both glad and sad when they saw uh, the next morning. So they did. They stopped, dismounted, uh, got off their horses, and they, they uh, picked some of those pebbles up. They put them in their pockets, and they went on their way. As the light of dawn breaks, the men reached into their pockets to pull out those pebbles, and to their great surprise, they held in their hands diamonds and rubies and precious gems. It was then that they realized the significance of what the voice said, that they would be both glad and sad. They were glad they had picked up the pebbles they did, but they were oh so sad that they had not picked up more. And that is how we live our life today. We're glad for what we have, but we're always wishing for more. Americans as a whole are unhappy. We take more antidepressant medication than any other country on the planet. What happens then? When people are are unhappy, well, often they turn to material things to feel better. Marilyn Monroe, which was, by the way, an unhappy person, said, happiness is not in money, but in shopping. (laughs) Why is that? My wife would agree with that largely, by the way. I find no happiness in shopping. There's a difference. Men buy, women shop. Have you ever noticed the difference in that? We know what we want, and we go get it, and we're out of the store in five or ten minutes. Uh, we uh, we go as a mission. Women go to to see what they want. You know, I don't I don't get it. But anyway, that's what she said in shopping. And why is that? The thought is here that your misery can be assuaged in the accusation uh, and the accumulation of more things. You're miserable. You're unhappy. If I can just get more stuff, I'll be happy. Unhappiness, materialism, friend, will not fix the gloom that is in your heart. Then there's also loneliness. We live in an incredibly lonely nation. The United States has the highest percentage anywhere in the world of one-person households, and most people do not know their neighbors that live next door to them. Even though we have more technology than ever before that connects us to everyone, most of our interactions are superficial at best. Twenty years ago, when I was nine, when I had a birthday... (laughs) When I would have a birthday about 20 years ago, I had 10, maybe 15 people wish me a happy birthday. This last year, when I had a birthday, I had over 130 people wish me happy birthday. Now you might say, wow, you must have really upped your popularity. No, it's called a Facebook timeline. People all over that are friends got a little notification, it's my birthday. They took one second out of their lives and typed happy birthday. And by the way, I'm not knocking it. If you did that, thank you. Uh, you're the only one I really appreciated in that. Because, and don't under, misunderstand, I'm not upset about it, but it's not real. It's not real. Amen? I, I always appreciate those who take time to text or phone call and, uh, you know, go a little bit the extra mile. Because really the online, and, and I'm not trying to put down anybody that meant a, a nice moment, but uh, this does not replace human relationships. Social media People who have a thousand social media friends can be as lonely as a Republican in California. I mean, it doesn't do anything for you. It really doesn't. I mean, social media, uh, we, we make such a big deal about all the followers and friends that we have, and yet we're lonely. We know the people, we, we see a list or have a thousand friends, and yet we, we get in trouble or we have a really rough day or some heartbreak, and we have no one we can call and talk to because we really don't have any true relationships. Loneliness. And what do lonely people? Well, author Rick Peters studied more than 2,500 consumers over six years. He found that loneliness was likely to lead to materialism. People view the material possessions as a type of happiness medicine. I need to go out and get more stuff. The, the odd thing is he found that loneliness increased in the lives of those who did just that. Because things, things, friend, do not fill the emptiness that's inside you. And there, we could also talk about advertising. The average American <coughs> is exposed to 40,000 uh, uh, commercials annually, all with the same message. Buy this and you'll be happy. The problem with the world's advertising is the same thing. That's the problem with Satan's advertising. There's a slick and tempting brochure, but what it pays out is not the same that's in the brochure. It will not deliver. I want to read a passage here this morning. 1 Timothy <coughs> 6. We're going to start at verse number 17. Charge them that are rich in this world. 
that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who give us us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Father, I pray you'd help us today as we look at this growing from materialism. Help us to learn even something maybe about ourselves. Let us be honest with ourselves as we do, we pray in Jesus' name. In chapter 6, verses 3 and 10, uh, 3 through 10, Paul is warning about the, the sin of greed, the passion for wealth. Now, in verse 17 through 19, he turns to warning those who possess wealth. Now, it is always a sin to have greed. It is not always a sin to have wealth. To have wealth is not evil in itself. In fact, often it is a blessing from God. Now, we see that throughout all Scripture where some of God's men were very wealthy. Wealth is not wrong. There's nothing wrong with having it. And if you have it, I'm happy for you. That's a good thing. However, the rich do have pitfalls and perils that the rest of the folks don't have. So Paul gives Timothy instructions to give to the wealthy. Our text is to rich Christians in the church at Ephesus. Charge them that are rich in this world. Now, this begs a question that I started off with. Who are the rich? Certainly it's not you or me, right? Uh, and it's interesting how we think. I read up on this a little bit. For Americans who have an income under $25,000, they said the definition of rich is anyone who makes more than $54,000. For those who make a hundred thousand dollars, they said the definition of rich to them is those who make anything over a hundred and ninety-two thousand dollars. So basically, rich is about twice as far as where you are right now, according to what they've done the surveys. But by the way, that means that somebody, if you have more than twice what somebody else have, they would think you're rich, like my kids. They said to me when they want, Dad, you're rich. Yeah, it's not, uh, to them I am because they got nothing, but. Uh, to, now, but but I, wanna, I want you to think about this because I want to ask the question, are you rich? And I'm not talking about spiritual riches. We'll get to that in a little bit. I'm talking about the Benjamins. I'm talking about cash. I'm talking about stuff. Are you rich? As a good test question for this, does your car have heated seats? Are you rich? Most of us would deny being rich, honestly. Most of us would deny that, but the truth of the matter is everyone in this room this morning, objectively speaking, is rich. I mean, if you simply live in this country, you are in the top 1% of the world. We have a higher standard of living than 99% of humans that live on this planet, that have ever lived on this planet. The United States has the highest disposable income in the world. A doctor in Iraq makes $1,800 a year. Uh, you see uh, in Ethiopia, the average annual salary is $108. In North Korea, I read just a few weeks ago, people will work hard all month long for about $3 at the end of the month. All over the world, countries, uh, uh, all over the world, people live and they may uh, work hard and work all day making less than a dollar a day. In the United States, the average household uh, spends $2,600 a year just on eating out. Uh, but even though we have this incredibly high living standard compared to the rest of the world, we still want more. It's still not enough. For the purpose of our message today, let us accept our good fortune that we live where we do. Let's just go ahead and concede that this is a message from a rich man to a rich people. We're rich when it comes down to it. And by the way, don't get defensive on that charge because it's not a sin to be rich. You don't have to go out and sell everything you have. That wasn't the point of what Jesus told that young, rich young ruler uh, the point of that, that he told him that was to show him where his heart was. Nothing wrong with having things. It's a good thing. It's a blessing. It's not what our text says. But the issue is not how much money you have. It's what you do with what God has given you. You make a living with what you get. You make a life with what you give. I want to see that from our text today. Let's consider three, before we get started here, let's consider three myths about materialism that are very common in our world today. Number one, myth number one, having more things equals more happiness. Having more things equals more happiness. I want to read you a couple of quotes. W.H. Vanderbilt, 
He was the Bill Gates of the late 1800s. He said, the care of 200 million is enough to kill anyone. There is no pleasure. In it. John Jacob Astor, one of the richest people in the world at his dot time, you might remember him, he actually died on the Titanic. But before that, he said, I am the most miserable person on earth, one of the richest people. John D. Rockefeller, I have made millions, but they have brought me no happiness. Henry Ford said, I was happier doing a mechanic's job. Money can do a lot of things, but it cannot buy happiness. Now, somebody said, tongue in cheek, if you say money can't buy happiness, you're not shopping at the right place. I understand money can bring comfort and temporary, but it can't bring you joy, it can't bring you peace, and it can't bring you lasting happiness. The truth is that some people are so poor that all they have is money, and it can't do anything as far as happiness goes. No, myth number two, having more things equals more important. Money cannot make you more important. Uh, life is tragic for those who have plenty to live on, but nothing to live for. Money cannot increase your importance in life. In the world of school shootings, and uh, well, I'll get to that in a minute, but uh, John Maxwell said, Secure, uh, success is investing in yourself, significance is investing in others. Having more things does not make you more important. However, having things can lead to doing the right thing with them, as we'll see in a minute. Myth number three, having more things equals more security. Material things cannot guarantee you any earthly security. In a world of terrorist attacks, school shootings and crime and all those things, there's no real security anywhere in the world today. Even those that serve the Lord, we don't have any guarantee that we have tomorrow even available to us. The Bible tells us in James 4.14, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even as a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanisheth away. There is absolutely no protection from suffering in this world. Money can guarantee you a, or cannot guarantee you a long life, good health, and only a fool would think otherwise. I think of the tragic death of Steve Jobs. He died at a young age of 56, around 3 p.m. on October 5th, 2011, due to a pancreatic tumor. Before he died, uh, shortly before he died, he looked at his sister Patty, he looked at his children, and then at his life's partner, Loreen. His final words were, oh, wow, oh, wow. Oh, wow, he slipped into eternity. He was worth $10.2 billion. Having more things does not, equal, does not guarantee you any more time. Things don't do that. Again, the money is not evil. I want to make that real clear. Money is not evil. I'd rather have it than not have it. Anybody with me? All right, of course. The love of money is what this passage is warning us against. In verse 10, Paul said, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. Now, we read that. You might be like me. You read that verse and you say, well, I don't love money. Then I read the next statement where it says, which while some coveted after, which that word for coveted after is orego. It means to reach after or desire something, to stretch oneself to touch or grasp something. It kind of hits us where we are. What one of us doesn't stretch ourselves to try to get more and to make more and to have more? And I get it. It's a natural thing for us. I come from a long line of tight wads. My wife is here, that's the only, or not here, that's the only reason I'm admitting this. All right. I prefer to call it a frugality expert. That's what I uh, term myself. Uh, what women call tight wads, men were frugality experts. Amen? That's where you should say amen. But it's a common desire for all of us to want to hold on to what we have and to try to get more. One man said, if money were a woman, I wouldn't say we were in love, but we are seriously dating. A lot of us are seriously dating when it comes to money. So having established, I hope we've established this. I hope we can agree that money in the end cannot satisfy. It cannot buy you more time, more life, more security. And it cannot get you satisfaction. And I hope we've established too that all of us probably are a little materialist, if we're honest with ourselves. We all struggle with this on some level. I really believe that. Now how do we grow then from materialism? How do we grow in our Christian life to get past this grip that materialism has on our life? Well, 1 Timothy 6 here that we read, it's 17 through 19, offers three specific commands that I want us to consider. The first one involves our heart. By the way, it has to. Our heart always comes first. Heart comes before our money. Every, the Bible says where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It's interesting to me that you'd think where your heart is, your treasure will follow. No, no, no. Your heart follows your treasure. 
And so what do we have to deal with? We have to deal with the heart issue of it. And that's the first one I want to mention. Examine your heart. Look at verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, which giveth us richly all things to enjoy. You know, it's possible to be rich in this world and be a pauper spiritually. Now, there's five important truths I want to gain from this verse here. Number one, first of all, we understand this. Some people will be rich. Some will have more than others. Even in churches, all right, some Christians have more than other Christians. Some have less, some have more. And there's nothing wrong with that. Usually we find that those who have more work harder, make better decisions. Uh, it, it, not always, but most of the time, it's a reward for labor. Secondly, money has the power to make us feel, again, feel insulated from the problems of life. We've already seen it doesn't do that. But money makes us feel invincible. That's why the Bible says, nor trust in uncertain riches. Not, none of that is certain. But money has a way of making us feel like what happens to others will not happen to me because I am secure. Thirdly, wealth truly is uncertain. It's uncertain. You can be rich today, friend, and tomorrow I'll be as poor as a charismatic at an auction. Think about it. it. It can move. It can fly. It can disappear. Riches are so uncertain. Look at the the stock market crash in 29. You have to look at that. There were uh, people that had the world by the tail. They were so poor that many committed suicide. It can disappear so fast. Money talks, one person said, and it often says goodbye. The Bible says so. Proverbs 23, 5, for riches certainly make themselves wings and fly away as an eagle toward heaven. You've probably experienced that before. Just think you've got it made. Your money takes wings. Fourthly, putting your hope in God <coughs> is a choice that we must make. He says, trust in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. It means that you, <coughs> excuse me, you consciously decide each day not to trust in your mere material possessions to get you through life. Hey, friend, you want to grow in your spiritual life? Start by putting your faith in something greater than what you can touch. Because everything you can touch can be lost, can disappear. Uh, we've seen it, vehicles destroyed. Homes burned down, money disappeared, lost in stock market, myriad of other ways. Medical bills that wipe out your fortune. God, it, they're not certain. None of these riches are certain. Number five, God wants, uh, gives us everything. This is a tough one. This is a tough one. So buckle your seatbelts on this one. God gives us everything we need at any given moment. Look what he says. God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. This is a statement that's easier said than believed or really accepted. Do we really believe that we have everything we need this moment in the material realm? Right now, do you have everything you need? If we believe God, the answer's got to be yes. In other words, friend, if you don't have it, God doesn't think you need it. There's things I want, things we all want. The kids' Christmas lists. You know, they never like to write papers until they get around to Christmas. Then all of a sudden, they're happy to write pages and pages of paper. We all got stuff we want. But we don't have everything we wish for simply because in the eyes of God, we don't need everything we wish for. We have everything we need. God doesn't withhold good things from his children. Did you know that? The Bible says in Psalm 84, 11, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. It says in Matthew 7, 11, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father in heaven know uh, give good things to them that ask him. Now, I understand that some even today are living with serious illness or much pain or or a physical handicap. How can we talk about God's goodness in that situation? Well, the Apostle Paul said it in, in uh, Philippians 4.11, I have learned whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. It is possible to be content no matter where I find myself or in what position or condition I find myself. We will be content to the degree that we have a proper view of God's involvement in our daily life. Can I say that again? You will be content only to the extent that you have a proper view of God's involvement in your daily life. If we separate God, if you take him out of your life, he's not a part of your daily existence, then you are now obligated to trust in, and hoard your wealth. After all, you're in charge. It's up to you. But if we trust in God's provision, we're free now uh, from the need to trust in insecure wealth that can't be secure. We've already looked at it clearly. We've got plenty of example from Bible and human experience. It's not secure. Never is. And now we're free to not trust in what's insecure if we put our trust in what is secure. Now I can give to missions. Now I can help that brother in need. 
Now I can live generously. You see, a proper view of God will lead to a generous view of life. This is why giving ought to be as natural for a Christian as breathing. Because we, our trust is in the Lord. It's not in our thing. Examine your heart, number one. Number two, consider your action. Once you've looked at your heart, now we move to the actions. First Timothy 6, 18 here. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Distribute means to be ready or free to impart. Communicate here means to be inclined to make others a share in your own possessions. I'm talking here about a generous, liberal, giving spirit. These uh, three things are mentioned in this verse. Look at it, verse 18. Doing good, being rich in good works, and a generous, giving spirit. You could say, doing good is the directive. Being rich and in good works is the dedication. And a generous, giving spirit is the development, the growth. This is where you see your growth. Now, notice this includes far more than what you do with your money. Materialism doesn't only impact the lives that we lead, but also it determines what kind of person we become. Materialistic people uh, tend to be narcissistic and only concerned about impressing others. They have a tendency to be anxious, depressed, filled with doubt. They more often than not have bad relationships. So it's especially tragic then when we have a materialistic Christian. If materialism ever satisfied anyone, it would have to be King Solomon. He's the richest man, perhaps, that ever lived. He certainly was in his day. He was rich beyond our imaginations. The man had 700 wives. Now, if you follow the math, carry the one, that's 700 mother-in-law, mothers-in-law. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying, just saying, a 700 mothers-in-law. And... Uh, only one mother, but only one man in history, by the way, didn't have a mother-in-law, and that's Adam. He lived in paradise. I don't know if they had anything to do with it, but I'm just saying. But Solomon's 700 wives all could have had Macy's credit cards, and it wouldn't have stressed him out one bit. He was so rich, he couldn't even begin to hope to spend all his money. He had absolutely everything, and this is what he said in Ecclesiastes 5. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied, with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. He said it's worth it. All the things I did, and read the book of Ecclesiastes. There's a real encourager, a real pick-me-up, the book of Ecclesiastes. He's saying it's all for nothing. It's all vanity, and it is when you take God out of it. Solomon, his conclusion in chapter 12, verse 13, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Jesus said the two greatest commandments we can keep is to love God and to love others. And materialism, my friend, interferes with your ability to love God right and to love others right. <laughs> materialism will step in the way of you obeying the, <coughs> the two greatest commandments according to Jesus Christ. Oh, such a destructive thing. Examine your heart, consider your actions, and then finally enjoy your reward. Look at verse 19. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Here's a promise for all of us. You, you might call this Jesus Christ's investment recommendation right here. The Christian life at times may be difficult, but Brother John, the require, retirement plans out of this world. The, that's the payoff. That's the, first, generous living lays a foundation for the future that will last all of eternity. Matthew chapter 6, verse 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. We all understand the concept of investing for the future. Maybe some of you made plans. I have things in place. I put money in every month to try to invest for my retirement and such. Uh, those, uh, or maybe you're saving for a new home or whatever it is. Uh, those are good things to do, to plan ahead. But here's the problem with materialism. It puts the focus and the intensity on the wrong thing. I have an illustration because I'm a visual person. Sometimes this helps, but I... One, I've used this before, but it's so good I thought I'd share it with you again uh, because it helps me to see things just a little different way. This rope here is going to represent eternity. It has a knot in it. But eternity, it goes off. We're just going to imagine it goes off in that door there and it just keeps on going forever and ever and ever. Okay, I bought a long rope. That's eternity. This blue part represents our life because when it comes down to eternity, our life is very short. We read it earlier. Our life is but a vapor appeareth for a little while, and it's gone. It's short compared to eternity. Now, what we do in this life, and this, I have a little black band there, if you can see it, that's going to represent our retirement. And Brother Wes, I didn't put 
black doesn't necessarily mean anything I, about the retirement. So it's just the color I had in my... This is retirement. So here's what we do. We spend all of this time hustling and bustling and saving and scrimping so that we might save up enough to have a house paid for and to have some money in the bank and to have a good retirement fund so that we might enjoy this time right here. Meanwhile, eternity is coming and we don't do anything to prepare for all of this. Now, isn't that foolish? But that's how we live. We make this the focus, just our life. And in our life, we, we, we love, and I do the same thing. I mean, I, I, I'm at the point in my life where I don't know if I'll ever retire. They say preachers don't retire. They just go out to pasture. But uh, you have, you have a, a, sh a life, and I look forward to the time that maybe I can take it a little bit easier and enjoy some of my time and the fruits of my labor. And nothing wrong with that, by the way. But don't let that outweigh your preparation for all that eternity. Listen, this is over so quickly. It's like a vapor and woof, it's gone. This is over even more quickly. This is forever. Where's your focus? In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talks about it, and he says, don't lay up treasure on earth. I'm, I'm bound by eternity. Don't, don't lay up treasures on earth. But why? Because it's so short. It's gone so quickly. So lay up treasures in heaven because it goes forever. Thieves can't take it. Rust can't. Man, everything. Rust kills stuff. I... I, it's a well-known fact. I, I'm a fan of Jeeps. I love Jeeps. And it's been kind of my whole life's dream as I uh, have worked up towards the Wrangler. And you know what I saw my Wrangler the other day? Rust bubble underneath, right by the... Just can't believe it. Rust destroys, doesn't it? Doesn't matter how nice what you have is. Rust will destroy it. Thieves can steal from it. Moths can take it. All these different things can happen, Jesus said, but you lay up treasure in heaven. Listen, materialism warps our priorities. And again... I don't want to, I've said it often, I don't want to repeat myself over and over, but it's nothing wrong with doing all these things and enjoying things and having things. Praise the Lord for that. And prepare for your retirement. Enjoy that time. That's all good. In fact, the Bible talks about those different seasons of life. But don't let that outweigh the importance of eternity. Eternity, my friend, is a long time. And we want to be prepared. How tragic to plan for our future here and to do nothing for eternity. So the best then alternative for materialism is eternityism. Okay? That's a word we're adding to the dictionary today. George Bush did it, I can do it. Eternityism. Living for eternity. Listen, here's the, here's the key right here. And I want you to grasp this because this is kind of the point of the whole message. Satan wants you chasing after what will never satisfy you for the primary purpose so that you don't chase after the only one that does. He can distract you with stuff that will never satisfy you. It will keep you from following the one who will. And that's what is ultimate. Satan knows we cannot serve both. Luke 16, 13, you cannot serve God and mammon. You can't do both. You've got to choose one. Uh, you can have, you can serve God and have money, but you can't serve God and serve money. That makes sense? You've got to choose which one you will serve. And so we have to make the right choice. The only way for us to have the right focus is if we have contentment, which is the opposite of materialism. If we recognize Luke 12, 15, that a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. That's not your life. Listen, how much you have or don't have, that's not who you are. That's not your life. Your life is, goes so much deeper than that. Once we understand that and then apply Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added and his righteousness, the Bible says. So we uh, put our priorities in. Uh, this, will not, this is not to say we can't have material things Praise God, I have nice things and you have nice things and we, we need to take the time to take a nice vacation. Those are great and we need to do all those things. Nothing wrong with that. The fact that God blesses us and gives us the ability to do things that we enjoy, this is wonderful, but the obsession or fascination with anything other than God is sinful. Deuteronomy 6, 5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Listen, God alone is worthy of our complete attention. He is worthy of our love and our service and our trust. And to offer that to anything or anyone else is nothing but pure deed idolatry. That's all it is. Let's not replace God. Listen, the happiest people on earth are those who have learned the joy of generous. They give of their time, their money, their advice, their counsel, their talents, their commitment. They're not content to be spectators while life speeds by. They get off the bench. They get in the game. They invest their resources into building lives. They truly enjoy giving to God 
and giving to others. It's the greatest life in the world. Oh, living one of a miserly, uh, watching everything and, and making sure you don't, uh, nobody takes advantage of you and the getting and the getting and putting everything you have and putting it all in a can, sitting on the can, and you're just uh, protecting all these different things. It's not a life of joy like a generous living is. Maxie Jarman was a wealthy Christian businessman. He gave away millions to Christian causes. At one point, he suffered an enormous financial reversal, and he lost everything. A friend asked him, said, boy, I bet you regret all that money you gave those Christian causes. And he says, oh, no, 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 you don't understand. I only lost what I kept for myself. Now, think about that. Because, you see, what we keep, we lose. Because we can't live forever, can't take it with us. What we give away, we keep. Because of the benefits of our giving, they last forever. That's laying up treasure in heaven. So the Bible talks about, and I'm not only talking about giving to missions, the Bible says, or, or the church and those type of things, but the Bible says that if you give a glass of cold water to someone, you shall in no wise lose. I'm talking about just generous living. I'm talking about giving of yourself, investing in others, and growing from materialism. The challenge today is to you and me, we're rich. We are rich. We've been given much. Compared to the rest of the world, we're at the top of the heap. There's no question about that. There is no need. I'm not trying to inspire any guilt today. But we ought to feel a profound sense of gratefulness and obligation. God never wastes his blessing. He doesn't pour them out on us so that we might use them for our own desires. He blesses us so that we can bless others. If you today, friend, are in the grip of materialism, ask God to help you grow out of that into generous living. As you live generously, you'll help yourself as well as helping others. In the process, that stranglehold of materialism will be broken in your heart. Because, friends, one of these days, we're going to stand before God. And we're going to have to give an account for the things that we've been given and the things that he's blessed us with. I don't think the Lord's going to ask us what rate of return we got from our mutual fund investment. I don't think that's going to matter. That, But he certainly will ask, what did you do with what I gave you? I think of the man in Luke 12, 20, when God tells the rich man, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall these things be which thou hast provided? By the way, there is no inkling of any sin in that story of the rich man. We read that rich man, and we, we I remember hearing in Sunday school, the root, wicked rich man that lived. Uh, other than the fact that he didn't have God in his life, he didn't do it. He was not a miser. He was not a cheat. He worked hard for his money. He was not, uh, he, he knew when he had enough. He wasn't greedy. Uh, he did all kinds of good things. He lived the American dream and he worked hard and he invested for the future. And then he came to a point in his life and said, I've got enough. I don't need more. I'm not greedy. And I'm going to enjoy my life. Nothing wrong with any of that except he took God out of the picture. And then God said, you're a fool because you, you spent all this time preparing for that. You spent no time and you're I'm asking you today, friend, where are your energies being expended? Are you preparing for this? I look forward to that. I mean, I, I, I look forward to taking a little decompression, maybe working a little less, all right? It's going to be good. But certainly got a lot longer time to look forward to than that. But what are you doing? For, what are you doing for eternity? You need to get beyond. Materialism warps us into thinking about this instead of... That's what materialism does. It warps, and that's what Satan does. He wants to get you so wrapped up in your stuff but you know, I even think about all this that's coming down the line. Get your priorities right. What you keep for yourself, you eventually lose. What you give to the Lord, you have for eternity. God wants you to value, desire, and worship one thing, one thing only, nothing else. Grow today out of your... We all struggle with it. To grow. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Give an opportunity to respond. If you're here today, friend, and you uh, maybe you're new or you're not... Uh, you know, we, we didn't talk much about salvation today, but friend, all of this is contingent on God being your father, on heaven being your home. If you've never accepted Christ as your savior, you don't even have any of this to look for. That's your first step. That's what you've heard. So if you're here today and you're not sure of your home in heaven, let's get that settled first of all. Come forward and somebody will take a Bible and show you how you can know that you know before you leave the church today, you're on your way to heaven. What about you, dear Christian? Have you been, let's not ask if you've been materialistic. Every one of us are materialistic. But is it stepping in, in the way of you doing what you need to do for God? Why don't you settle that today? Would you stand along with me, heads bowed, 